Today we're doing part two. Uh, so we spoke about the Hebrew Bible, now we're speaking about biblical interpretation. And in effect, what I said on Monday is what makes the Bible the Bible is the interpretation. That is to say, ancient, medieval, and for some Jews and Christians to this very day, the Bible is read differently from the way any other book is read. Because the reader brings with him or her to the book a whole set of assumptions that are very different from the assumptions that we bring to bear when we read any other book. And then, in effect, it is those assumptions that the reader brings to the text are what make the Bible the Bible. You strip those assumptions away, the Bible turns out to be just like Homer's Iliad, or for that matter, just like, I don't know, a play of Shakespeare, or any other literary artifact, which you, know, you like, you don't like, you appreciate, you don't appreciate, you believe, you don't believe, but you assess it like anything else. What makes the Bible the Bible are, in fact, these assumptions. Those fundamental assumptions are shared by Jews and Christians, but of course they manifest themselves, or they wind up in result as a consequence in very different places, because one of them winds up in Judaism, and one of them winds up in Christianity, and as we've already discussed, they are not the same. Okay, that's where we were, right? So today we're doing the Christian side of the equation, but to uh, make sure we'll, we compare like with like, I'll be constantly referring back to Judaism, and your lecture notes do that too, so I don't have to repeat everything because you're writing the lecture notes. Okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> so we have those big four assumptions. This is the way I phrased it, uh, and Stern in your reading has a slightly different formulation, and he gets in turn from Kugel has a slightly different formulation, but that doesn't really matter. Right, so we said the Bible is, for these readers who approach the Bible as Bible, the Bible is eternally true, omnisignificant, revealed by God, and speaking to and about us. These are the four exegetical assumptions that we spoke about on Monday, and I gave examples of that on the Jewish side, and we concluded with some examples from the Mechilta on Exodus, which we'll come back to shortly. So on the Christian side, how do these, ex how do these assumptions work? Well, as before, it's an apple and an orange, or it's an apple and a banana, right? The Jews and Christians have the same assumptions, but they manifest themselves differently, and they work out differently with different results. So, Jews and Christians alike believe the Bible is eternally true, right? The Bible's truth is not historically conditioned, right? It's not anchored in a certain societal context. It was true then, it was true for them, but it's not true for us, or it's not true later. No, 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 you don't think that way. If it's true, it's true, period. It's eternally true. It's truth and door. So this we I saw we saw some examples of that on the on, on the Jewish side. On the Christian side, we can well there are a number of examples. Christians will think that biblical truth, just by God Himself, is eternal. So the truth and the truth endure. And we see some of that, let's say for example, in modern day Christendom, just to jump ahead a few millennia from where we were. Uh, modern Jews and Christians mostly Christians, are busy citing Leviticus 18 and 20 to justify the position that male homosexual intercourse is sinful. You can write about this in your paper if you want. All right, male homosexual intercourse is sinful. Why? Because Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 says so. Now you might say in reply, Leviticus 18 and 20, well, you know, they were written a long time ago in different social circumstances when human society was different, didn't understand sexuality, didn't understand homosexuality, uh, the family had a different structure, blah, 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 blah. Consequently, those laws might have made some sense then, but they don't make any sense now, you might argue. To which a believing Jew or Christian reply would say, no. If they were true then, they're always true. Right? The idea is that it's eternally true. Similarly, some Christians and Jews oppose the belief in evolution on the grounds that they think evolution contradicts Genesis chapter 1, which maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but that's a different discussion. Uh, let's say that it does, right? So you could say in reply, well, Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter of the Hebrew Bible, represents some ancient Israelites' best effort to understand how the world came to be. Now it's pretty good, you know, it's some things are, you know, we did pretty well, uh, you know, it's very convincing, it's sort of philosophical, it's sort of poetic, it's very nice, but you know, hey, it's written by a guy a long time ago. We know a lot more than they did then, so uh, what's the surprise that we now know things that they didn't know? 
Well, no, you can't say that. If you believe the Bible is eternally true, well then, it was true then, and it's true now. So in this conflict of truths, the Bible is going to win out, if that's the assumption you bring to bear on the text. This is something you'll find then both for, both for some modern Jews and Christians and for virtually all pre-modern Jews and Christians alike. The Bible is eternally true. The trick, of course, is to figure out what it means. Uh -huh. That's not so simple. Okay, but that fundamental truth is shared by Jews and Christians alike. Next, um, these, okay, questions on this? Okay, here I've given you some ideas you can talk about in your paper, right? So, you know, okay. So it's not accidental. Okay, omnisignificant, right? Every last little detail means something, right? Uh, everything means something. Omni, everything, significant. Okay, this I already spoke out briefly. This stance is not as significant in Christian exegesis as far as I can see, perhaps because Christians read the Bible in translation. But Christian exegetes, too, when they want to, can seize upon any little detail in the text and say this teaches us something about Christianity, teaches us something about Christ, about God. And, and we'll see that, that Christians are quite capable, too, of very close readings of biblical texts in which individual words and phrases are, uh, meaning is extracted from individual words and phrases. So they don't go to the same extreme, perhaps, as our friend the rabbis do, but uh, they're quite capable of something similar. And we will see examples of that in the course of our term. Okay, that was omnisignificant. Then was revealed by God. Right here I spoke about the fact that it's uh, divine speech is not human speech. Divine speech can, needs to be read in different ways from the way you and I speak, you and I write. Consequently, we read it differently, we understand it differently. Um, and there is a whole notion of uh, needs interpretation on the one hand. On the other hand, it is charged with meaning, right, with layers and layers of meaning. When you and I write a book, of course, we barely get away with one meaning. If we're lucky, we make that one meaning clear. But when God speaks, of course, there are, tempted to say, infinite meanings. Okay, that's what we saw on Monday. Here on the uh, Christian side, Christians would say the Bible, also they would agree with, with Jewish readers, that the Bible has levels of meaning. And we'll come to this in just a moment when we talk about allegory and typology. So Christians, too, would agree. The Bible is a book of divine speech. Divine speech needs to be interpreted, not just read casually, it needs to be interpreted, and it is charged with meaning, full of meaning. Again, I don't think they take the idea of polysemy to the same extent that the rabbis do, where the rabbis will give you another interpretation, another interpretation, another interpretation, another interpretation, without ever bothering to argue when it's right and when it's wrong, because they're all true. Right, Christians, I think, don't go to that sort of same extreme, perhaps, but they have the same idea, though, that there are multiple layers of meaning in a text. We'll come to that. Last but not least, the most, most important thing is speaking to and about us. Once again, the Bible is not historically conditioned. It is anchored in time and space merely because it came from a certain time and space. But that time and space are irrelevant understanding what the Bible says. So, for example, if you are a Christian, Right, then, of course, you believe that Isaiah of Jerusalem, a prophet of the second half of the 8th century BCE, right, prophesied about Christ, about Christ coming into the world, about Christ's death, uh, the passion of Christ, uh, bringing redemption to the world through his suffering. This all comes out of Isaiah 53, right, as well as prophecies of future divine <coughs> glory and peace when Christ's name will become manifest. Now, you will believe that as a Christian, because Isaiah of Jerusalem is a true prophet. And if you say in reply, but Isaiah of Jerusalem lived in the 8th century BCE, it doesn't make any sense. How is a guy living in the 8th century BCE going to talk about the Christian message from the 1st century CE, and then to prove it on the further that you, the Christian reader, say he's talking about me, he's talking about us, talking about my sins, about my redemption. That doesn't make any sense. To which I would reply on behalf of Christians, well, yeah, it doesn't make any sense if you think Isaiah of Jerusalem is just another guy and uh, the book that he wrote, the book of Isaiah, is just another book. Then you would say, yeah, he wrote the 8th century B.C. He was very nice, thank you very much, but that's, you know, it's all ancient history now. But no, Isaiah of Jerusalem was a man of God, as a prophet, and his book is part of the Bible which comes from God. 
So why is it so surprising or weird to imagine that a man living 8th century BCE spoke about events centuries hence? And those events centuries hence apply to me, apply to us Christians. This is a great example. So for Christians, the book of Isaiah is a Christian book. And if you want to argue, gee, it's completely anachronistic, completely an ahistorical reading, it's sort of absurd. Go to, go, go to Gothic cathedrals, you see portraits of Isaiah in stained glass carrying a cross. It's not absurd at all. I understand it completely. If it's true, it's true. He's talking about us. Talking about us Christians. Talking about Christianity. So this is a common attitude that both Jews and Christians alike. So Jews will read the Torah and think that Moses is a rabbi. Christians will read the book of Isaiah and think that Isaiah is a Christian. Right? The text is actualized. It's speaking about us, our kind, our people, our communities, our church, our synagogue, etc. Okay. Those are the four uh, big points. Uh, questions, of suggestions, comments? Anybody want to say anything? Why exactly is it, does it not make sense that uh, Isaiah may have prophesied about like centuries later? So? Well, it doesn't make sense if you are approaching the text uh, from a modern Western historicistic uh, perspective, where you assume that any text is, is part of a context. Right, you would assume the best way to understand Isaiah of Jerusalem is to understand the 8th century BC and international politics and Judah and uh, Syria and the Northern Kingdom and uh, Egypt and armies and well, you know that's what you would think you need to understand Isaiah. Whereas a Christian will say, no, you don't need any of that to understand Isaiah. What you need to understand Isaiah is the life, death of Christ. If you understand that, you'll understand Isaiah. Now, somebody might say that makes no sense if you don't share these assumptions. If you are a historically minded, if you are a modern Bible scholar, you would say, that's very interesting, but it doesn't make any sense. I can't believe that's what Isaiah really meant. To which the Christian would respond, no, that's what Isaiah meant. Well, there are different ways a Christian would respond to that, but uh, the simplest level would be the Christian would say, yeah, this is what Isaiah meant. A much trickier way for a Christian to speak would be to say, this is what Isaiah means, because we understand how the words have been fulfilled. But maybe Isaiah didn't really understand himself what he was saying. Right, if you were, that's a more sophisticated reply, where you would say, just as we would say, an author doesn't fully understand his own work, you would say, Isaiah does not fully understand his own prophecy. It's only with the arrival of Christ that it became clear what those words meant. But Isaiah said things that he himself realized he didn't fully understand. Hmm, interesting. Okay, um, I'll come on back to that in one second. Okay, help answer your question. Other, other questions, please? Good, then let's move right along. So how do the Christians make the Bible apply to us? Namely, how do Christians turn the Bible into a Christian book? And here I gave you a very nice essay to read by Justo Gonzalez, about whom I know very little, except that he, in spite of his Hispanic surname, he seems to be a Protestant. That's about all that I know about Justo, Justo uh, Gonzalez, because it's, it's published in a Protestant publishing house context. So the, from which I do see he's a Protestant of one flavor or another, I don't remember which. Uh, but otherwise, there's nothing about him, except he seems to be a very competent fellow, and I like the essay very much. So there you are. That's all that I can tell you about Justo, Justo Gonzalez. And of course, as a true Christian, you would say, context doesn't mean anything anyway, right? Either it's true or it's not. All right, that's supposed to be clever. Okay, so uh, let's go back to where we are. So, so I'll briefly hit the main points from Gonzalez's essay, but I think it's a, it's a very nice essay and sets out the material very well and very, very clearly. So, he argues that Christians turn the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, into a Christian text. Isaiah becomes a Christian book, the Psalms become a Christian book, etc., etc., right, through fundamentally three modes of reading. 
And he refers to these as the prophetic, the allegorical, and the typological. And we are going to come back to these again and again over the next several weeks. So it's worth uh, making sure we understand, at least in theory, what these things mean, so we'll recognize them when we see them on the ground. So, prophetic. We just, we just touched on the prophetic. The Christian will argue that Jesus' life and death, resurrection, fulfill, that's the word, fulfill the prophetic prophecies. Now, though I explain, the tricky thing is it's possible that Isaiah himself did not fully understand the full meaning of his prophecies, but we do. Now that we can take the book of Isaiah over here, and we can take the Gospels over here, and bring them together, it's obvious what Isaiah means. This is one of the main motifs in the Gospel of Matthew. Right, the Gospel of Matthew, as any reader will notice within 10 seconds, the Gospel of Matthew is interested again and again in showing how Jesus' moments in Jesus' life, key moments in his life, and also in his death, fulfill, that's the word he uses, fulfill the meaning of Scripture. Jesus did X, it's because the prophet said. And this fulfills the prophet. So it's a prophetic reading. Now maybe Isaiah knew this in advance, maybe Isaiah did not know this in advance, but Isaiah's words stand eternally true, and now in retrospect we understand what he was talking about. Okay, so we have the prophetic. We will see our friend Justin Martyr, from whom we'll be doing some reading, uh, in the, uh, starting in two weeks, right? He is, loves to quote prophets. Right? He loves to quote the prophets to show that the prophecy, these d dark, obscure uh, words of the prophets, whose meaning is not at all clear, they become very clear once you juxtapose it to the life, death of Christ, Christian theology. It all becomes very clear. That's uh, clearly what they're talking about. So that's what we mean by the prophetic, right? Uh, arguing that the words of the prophets receive their fulfillment in the life and death of Christ. Christ, when sometimes in the life of the church, but usually in the life and death of Christ. Okay, that's prophetic. That's pretty straightforward. <laughs> straightforward, I mean, in compared to allegory and typology, which are much more complicated. Right. So uh, these are the next ones. Allegory and typology. What do we mean by that? Allegory. Allegorical mode of reading treats the text as metaphors for moral and philosophical truths. In other words, the text says X, but an allegorical meaning says it really means Y. I know it says X. And I know that X does not at the surface appear to mean Y, but trust me on this, the allegorist will say, X really means Y. And what is the Y? The Y is some kind of, is what I called it here, moral and philosophical, philosophical truths. In other words, an allegorical reading undoes the reality, the physicality, the plain, simple meaning of the, uh, of the terms. Now let's have an example. Right? It always gives you some discussion. But here's an example that will come up in a few weeks' time. Moses says in the Bible, both in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, you may not eat pork. Right? You may not eat any animal that does not have a cloven foot, uh, cloven hoof, and chews its cud. Right? Pigs don't qualify. Don't only have one out of the two. Don't eat pig says pretty clearly and unambiguously both in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Okay, we'll discuss this in a few weeks' time. Now, if you are an allegorist, sorry, if you are a simple-minded Jew reading the text, you would say what this means is Moses says you shouldn't eat pork. Why did Moses say you shouldn't eat pork? I don't know exactly. That's not very clear. There's no reason given. But that's what it says. Either your believer comes from God, Moses, the Torah, or not. But that's what it says in the text, and that's what we Jews do. We don't eat pork. Now, if you are an allegorist, perhaps a Jewish allegorist, and certainly a Christian allegorist, then you would say as follows. What does it mean when Moses says not to eat pork? 
Now, she might say she means it shouldn't be pork. Yeah, I know that's what you might say, but clearly that's not what it really means. Because clearly pork represents something. It represents something, some negative moral quality that we are to avoid. Or certain kinds of people with whom we are not to associate. Certain kinds of behavior that we must eschew. What is that? <coughs> well, I'll tell you what it is. A pork swine represents, uh, well, it'll come up with something, swinish behavior. <laughs> right? A pig is a pig. So Moses, when Moses says, don't eat pork, what Moses really means is, do not associate with humans who behave like pigs. Do not engage in swinish behavior. I know it says, do not eat pork, but what it means is, do not associate with human beings who have negative moral values which can be represented by a pig. That would be a classic, simple example of an allegorical reading of the text. Now the key, the key thing here, of course, is that allegory does, or certainly has the potential, to undo the text. So now that I've discovered what Moses really meant in his prohibition of eating pork, does that mean I can go home and have some bacon? <laughs> as long as I don't hang out with swinish and piggish people, as long as I don't engage in piggish behavior, it's okay to have, perfectly fine to have uh, some bacon bits on my salad. Bacon's are made. Yeah, nowadays bacon's aren't made out of bacon anymore. But in the good old days when bacon bits were still bacon, yeah, now it's just smoked hydrolyzed soy protein. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you for that uh, observation. Yes. Right. So, is it okay to have ham and eggs in the morning? No. No. Who said no? Why did you say no? Because it's all true. It's all true. Aha. Uh -huh. That's the point. Right? It all depends upon interpretation. If you are an allegorist, you would say, there's no logical reason why a god should care if I eat ham and eggs for breakfast or not. Tell me what on earth could possibly be sinful about eating ham and eggs for breakfast. I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense at all. Or if I want to have a, a slice of bacon with something, what's so terrible? Why should God care? What difference does it possibly make? It makes no sense. That can't be what God really wants. What God really wants, of course, is... I should behave properly. I should be, as my late mother used to say, you should be a mensch, right? Behave like a good human being. Don't be a pig. Don't hang out with pigs. Clearly that is a something which is appropriate for God to command me to do or to aspire. And that surely is what Moses must have meant. Consequently, I can eat as much pig and pork, bacon and swine as much as I'd like. And doing so is not a violation of the law, because what the law is really about is this allegorical meaning, right? The law has now been turned into a piece of moral preaching. We will, we will find this is, a, this is a good example of a simple kind of allegory. But what, what makes allegory allegory is the fact that you have this opposition between the plain, simple, surface meaning of the text. Often the language used would be, this is the body, the allegorical meaning is the soul, this is external, this is internal, this is the letter, this is the spirit, this is lower, this is higher. Right, allegorical reading almost always is accompanied by a self-consciousness, a realization that what we are doing is not in fact the plain simple, outer, literal meaning of the text, that we in fact are insisting the text has to mean something different, which in our, which in our taxonomy is higher, because it's a moral, philosophical, theological truth. Now, an allegory doesn't have to undo the text, but trust me on this, it does. Right, you could say in reply, well, what's wrong with both meanings? Moses meant you shouldn't eat pork. 
And he also meant you shouldn't hang out with piggish people. Why can't you say they're both true? The letter and the spirit, the inner and the outer. You could, but allegorists, just by the nature of things, always favor the, as I said, the moral philosophical meaning over the literal one. And the result is allegory tends to undo the reality of the text to which it refers. Be it a legal case, such as this one, a ritual law case from, from the Torah, or example would be uh, narratives. Narratives. So um, Genesis chapter 12, God says to Abraham, go forth. Go forth from your land, from your birthplace, to a land that I will show you. And Abraham picked up his wife and his possessions and slept off to where God told him. That's a loose paraphrase of uh, uh, lines of Genesis 12. Now the allegorist will say, what is this about? Is it a story about some guy who lived a long time ago who picks up his tent and his clan and his cattle and sheep and goats and travels from one place to another? Well, yeah, that's what it looks like, I know. But is that really about? In other words, is the book of Genesis chock full of stories, little soap opera stories about a slightly dysfunctional family in ancient, ancient Canaan? No, that doesn't make any sense. Why would God tell us a book of stories about a dysfunctional clan? You know, the son sleeps with his stepmother, and yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's sordid, I tell you. <laughs> These brothers gang up against another brother and sell them into slavery. I mean, it's not a nice story. Why are not nice stories? So why is Genesis full of these stories? Uh -huh, I'll tell you. Because the stories, of course, must be teaching us higher truths. And Abraham's journey from his homeland to a distant place is, in fact, a story about the soul, the ascent of the soul, or the ascent of the mind in its quest for unity with the monad. God who is one. That's what it's really about. It's teaching me a story, it's teaching me truths about the life journey. Ah, that I understand. That's something that belongs in the Torah. Now I understand why Moses is telling me these stories, because stories don't mean what they think they look like they mean, they mean something else. So here again, allegory will undo the reality of, of the text, of the text. Okay? Yes? Kind of pulled on. Uh, uh, well, I'm tempted to say the more outrageous, the more difficult, the more problematic the text, the more likely it is to be subjected to allegory as a way of rescuing it, right? as a way of turning a problematic text into a respectable text. That's one thing allegory will do. So it's kind of like only in the past couple hundred years of science has creation story become problematic? Oh, the, crea oh, the creation story? Yeah, well, the creation story is problematic because of the whole philosophical idea of creation, which we'll discuss down the road a piece. The whole idea of God creating a world is a problem. If you, if you are an Aristotelian, it's a problem. Right, then by late antiquity, all Jews and Christians who are educated, you know, are Aristotelian in that sense, right, then the whole issue of creation itself. I don't care about Genesis chapter 1 being literal and other seven days literal, just the whole act of divine creating the world is a problem. Because then if, if all right, that's later, it's coming up. So that sense is problematic. You know, the details though, the seven days of creation, you know, well, the ancients themselves are arguing, are these seven days, how can there be seven days? There's day one before there's a sun and a moon and stars, so how do you have a day without a sun and day and night, huh? huh? Right, you know, so clearly, clearly the whole thing doesn't, it's clearly the whole thing can't be, quote, literal. Well, what does it mean then, you ask? Oh, well, <laughs> okay, so here you have a whole cottage industry of Jews and Christians alike who are slaving away over trying to penetrate the inner meanings of Genesis chapter 1. That's long before Darwin came around. And long before we looked in the periscope, we looked in the telescope and found Uranus out there, uh, you know, and discovered that the Earth goes around the sun, not the reverse. You know, long before that, the text was already a, a, tr a, a challenging text, let's put it that way. I don't say troubling, it's challenging. Right, except that you know, Jewish and Christian readers are not going to say, well, it's a bunch of ancient Israelite myth makers who are telling stories and you know, you can forget about it. No, 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 they, they can't do that because they have these working assumptions. So they can't do that. So instead they think. Okay, move along. 
sir? Yes. How can you just how can you do that? Just go and make something out of it. And just, you know, how do you accept it's truth? How do you do that? You because you you know in your heart of hearts you know that the text can, cannot mean what it says it means. It can't. And if you begin with that working assumption with that you are possessed by that idea, then you're on. That's already half the battle. Now some exegetes will argue that the exegesis of a difficult text requires just as much divine inspiration as the original author of the text had. In other words, to interpret divine words required divine help. So Isaiah spoke with God, and to read Isaiah, I need God's help. All right, so there is some notion, in many, both Jews and Christians alike, so occasionally you see this, is this notion that not anybody can read a text and interpret it. You need special gifts, special grace from God, right, in order to be able to interpret a text. Just as nowadays, not anybody can be a psychoanalyst. <coughs> Maybe it's not a good analogy, but... <laughs> right, you need someone who can see things that the rest of us don't see. All right, just take that analogy for what it's worth. Okay, let's go back to where we are. Uh, so, the key thing in the allegorical sense is that we have an opposition between the literal, the external, the physical, the corporeal, the carnal, Right, versus the inner, higher, spiritual, et cetera, et cetera, meanings, the clear sense. There's a clear uh, sense of at least two levels of meaning in the text. That's very clear, and, and the, for the allegorist, the allegorical reading, in effect, and sometimes not just in effect, but clearly and obviously, undoes and is meant to undo the literalness of the text. This will be very, these will be very, this will be a very common Christian maneuver or Christian hermeneutical strategy, exegetical strategy, when reading the Hebrew Bible, especially when reading all those pesky, annoying laws that Christians don't want to observe. Like, for example, Moses commanding us not to eat pork. <coughs> we'll come back to that, not to worry. Okay, over the centuries, this two-level system becomes elaborated into three levels, or ultimately four levels. Okay, fine, I'll give you some information there that might interest you, but I'm going to skip it. Okay, but it's right there. If you want to read it, read it. Okay, now this compares and contrasts with typology. The typology is a tricky, tricky concept, and again, discussed by, by Gonzalez. Um, and so a typological reading is a reading which looks at scripture and argues that, again, this is a Christian talking, uh, argues that Scripture is filled with types. Perhaps we might call these archetypes, or models, or paradigms, or patterns, right? Where scripture sets up, and these paradigms, archetypes, models receive their fulfillment in almost always we're talking about the life and death of Christ. So, the key difference between, so a type is a kind of a symbol, an allegory is a kind of a symbol. What's the difference between the two? Well, at the end of the day, I agree with Gonzalez, the typology does not undo the reality of the text, whereas an allegory does. So, a good example, Noah and the Flood. Right, the story in the book of Genesis, right? God, <coughs> humanity is sinful, God decides to punish them and start over again. Realize it didn't work out too well with Adam and Eve, we'll start over again. <clears throat> so he picks a new righteous person, Noah. <clears throat> and Noah and his three sons and their wives and children will pack away into the ark. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the word ark is Latin for a box, into a large box, and two of every kind are put into the uh, ark to save to save these creatures for the after the flood. But no, maybe seven of every kind. The text is a little confusing. Anyway, back to where we are. So two of every kind go into the box. Then there's a mighty flood. The world is wiped out. And then the flood waters dissipate. The ark settles down. Up come Noah and his sons with their wives and children. And they repopulate the earth. The animals come out and repopulate the earth. That's the story in the book of Noah, in the book of Genesis about Noah. If you are a Christian or a Jew, you know, of course, it's a true story. All right, and there are Christians to this very day who have expeditions out to Armenia looking for relics of the, of the lost ark. Lost ark here meaning that box of Noah. Now, if you are a Christian, you also know the story is a type. 
The story of Noah is true. There was a man named Noah, and he had three sons, right? And the story exactly is what happened. The story is a type because it sets up a model by which we Christians can understand the life, death, and salvific power of Christ. Because what does it mean that the world is sinful? It means because we humans are all sinful. What does it mean that God brings a great flood? God brings death into the world. And how do we escape this death? Answer it through the power of the wood. What is the wood? The wood is the wood of the, of the box, the boat. But it's also the wood of the cross. <coughs> right? That is how we are saved from the sin all around us and by the flood, which, which threatens us at every turn. Right? That we are saved through the power of the wood, the power of the cross. And, Moses, and Noah, at the end of the story, opening the ark and coming out, well, that's the Christian soul. That's we Christians who come out and are saved through the effic efficacious, salvific power of Christ. That's a type. So there was a man named Noah. There was an ark. There was a flood. But at the same time, that story receives Christian fulfillment or understanding by realizing the story is historical at one level, on another level, it is really about Christ. So, how do you explain exactly a type then? So it's a model, it's a pattern, it's a paradigm, it's, it's a little slippery here, I understand, right? And clearly it looks just like an allegory, but the key point is we're saying an allegory would mean then that there was a man named Noah. The whole thing is just symbolic. And the symbol is everything and the reality is nothing. Whereas a, type, a typolog typological reading would say, no, the story is a true story, but it sets up a pattern for what's going to happen later. Those of you who are taking English 101 can no doubt come up with all kinds of theoretical, multi-syllabic, incomprehensible terms by which to describe these things in greater detail. So we see some of that, and i got to hurry up, but one of the main John motifs in John 6 is food. Right? The chapter, of course, opens with the feeding of the multitudes. John, and there are several different stories of feeding of the multitudes. Is it fish or is it bread? I mean, you know. Anyway, 5,000, 4,000, whatever. There are a whole bunch of different versions of the same story. So it begins with the feeding of the multitudes. The people are hungry, and through his miraculous power, Jesus is able to feed them. Then the people come to him and they want food. Once we have this food motif, right, this slides very naturally and easily into the who is the real food? What is the real bread? And of course, it's Christ, who is the bread of life. The bread of life, of course, is the manna in the wilderness. That same chapter, Exodus 16, that I ask you to look at for Monday, right, is applicable here too. But Jesus, unambiguously, or clear references to those, that chapter 16, also the passage in the Psalms, Right? Where the manna is food from heaven. And Jesus is asking, what is the real food from heaven? So here we have, part, I, partly it's a typology, where Jesus says, well, the story about food, God raining down food in the wilderness to the hungry Israelites, by which they are fed, by which they eat the manna that comes from God, that's the bread of life, use the term from the Psalms, the bread of life, well, that's a story about the Israelites in the wilderness, but it's also about me. Because I am the bread of life. I, Jesus, am the bread of life. And here we have a little passage in, in John 6. Here, these verses, verse 53 to 59, where we seem to have a reference to the ritual of the Eucharist, right? Which Jesus seems to refer to eating my body and eating or drinking my blood, which of course will become one of the two main Christian rituals, the Eucharist on the one hand, or Holy Sacrament on the one hand, and baptism is the other main Christian ritual. We'll come back to these things down, down the road. But here we have the sense that the Christian, by eating the bread and drinking the wine, participates in the life, and more importantly, in the death and resurrection of Christ. In that sense, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Eat me. Eat me and live. We have that in these verses, a clear <coughs> reference to the Eucharist. This is interesting because the Gospel of John does not have a Last Supper. 
Gospel of John does not have the institution of the Eucharist that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. We'll come back and talk about that down the road. But here, he seems to know about the uh, Holy Sacrament, Sacrament of the, of the Eucharist, and something like a Last Supper, even though he doesn't actually have one in his narrative when he gets to it. I'll explain why when we get there in a couple of few weeks down the road. Anyway, so we have then the typology. Israelites, manna, food from heaven, bread of life over here. And now we understand, we Christians understand what those things really mean, what they really represent. At the same time, Jesus also does something slightly allegorical here, where he says, he compares and contrasts. That was not the real bread of life, the manna in the wilderness. Why was, not, why, that, why was that not the real bread of life? No, no, no. Because what happened to those Israelites? They died. But I am the real bread of life. So do you partake of me, of Christ, then you will live. You will triumph over death. So we have also, in addition to this typological motif, we also seem to have something which I would say comes out of the allegorical notion of an oppositional uh, between the actual simple meaning of the text and Jesus. I'm not quite sure how to disentangle this. But in any case, this would be a good example of the Christian reading of scripture. Our rabbis read in the Mechilta, as we saw, also see the manna as the bread of God, bread of life, food from heaven, right? But Christians take exactly that same motifs looking at exactly the same verses and turn it into, we see this very early, it's already in the gospel, turn it into a message of Christian truth. Right? They get at the very heart of the Christian theology, namely the uh, redemption through participation in the life and death and resurrection of Christ. Neither Jews nor Christians read the Bible literally. Okay, I'm going to say this. And I know you don't believe me, and you're going to write it down in your notes, but at the next exam you're going to tell me Jews read the Bible literally and Christians read it allegorically. I know you're going to tell me that. However, let me explain. I don't think, ne I, I, sorry, I'll say it again. Neither Jews nor Christians read scripture literally. If by literally you mean what we modern Bible scholars, westernized, historicized readers of texts mean. Literally means we think it's the original meaning. Right? We privilege the original meaning overall. We want to get at what does the Torah really mean. We say, well, what did the Torah mean when it was written? In that sense, neither Jews nor Christians are reading the Bible literally. The major difference is that whereas Christians will say, I can fulfill the commandment not to eat pork by abstaining from certain moral you know, immoral acts, but I can go ahead and eat bacon, the Jews will say, no, the meaning, the literal meaning of the text endures. That is to say, we may not eat pork. Why? I don't know, but that's what God says. In that sense, Jews are literal, and Christians are not. But in another sense, in another very real sense, Jews are not literal at all. I.e., they are not engaged in reconstructing the original meaning of the text. On the contrary, they make up all kinds of incredible readings of the text. They do so all the time. You see that example in the Chilta passage? And that's this classic example of that was discussed in your reading uh, from Stern on Monday about boiling a kid in his mother's milk. Sorry for talking about food all the time, but I'm a Jew, so I'm obsessed with food. You know, that's, this is a well known. This is well known. Catholics are obsessed with sex, and Jews are obsessed with food. Right? So, uh, so, so, so back, 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 to where I, back to where I was. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. What is the plain, simple meaning of that passage? You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. I have no idea. Okay, let's make it clear. Nobody has any idea. Boy, the kid in his mother's milk. But our rabbis of blessed memory came up with the bright idea that what Moses meant was not to eat meat with dairy. So you shouldn't put a slab of butter on your lamb chop. Right? You should not, uh, you should not uh, put a piece of cheese on your hamburger. And if you object, how on earth does this possibly mean you're mixing meat and dairy? So don't boil a kid in his mother's milk. Right? How on earth do you get from that to not having a cheeseburger? I explain that. Well, that's a long story there, but in any case, uh, it's clear this is not, quote, the literal meaning of the text. So if you mean by literal, uh, you know, the original privileged contextual meaning, then Jews are no more literal than Christians are. If you mean do Jews actually take the law seriously, the physical, the carnal, the corporeal, the literal, external meaning of the text, yes, 
Jews have a tendency to accept these things, and Christians have a tendency to reject them. Okay, you got the distinction? You got what I'm getting at? Yes. So will you say simply as a simple sentence, Jews read the Bible literally? Would you say that, class? No. 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 But you will. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to skip the next bullet point and go to the last big bullet point. Christian exegesis is programmatic. This is something that, the point that Gonzalez makes, and it's a very important point. Let's say when Christians read the Hebrew Bible, they know what they're looking for. They're looking for Christ. And you know what? They find him. So it turns out any biblical passage, any biblical law, any biblical story, when properly manipulated by the exegete, it turns out to be talking about Jesus. Turns out we're talking about Christ, or the life of the Christian, or theological truth claims of Christianity. It turns out. This is what I mean by programmatic. Or I'm tempted to say there's a monomaniacal focus here. That I know I'm blinders. They know what they're looking for. It's not a bad thing. I'm just saying that it is. Whereas Jews, as we saw in the Mechilta passage, when they read scripture, they're open. They can find almost anything. In fact, it's almost amazing what, what will come out of a passage, as we saw in the Mechilta passage. Right? Musings about all kinds, of, all kinds of things. There is no program in that sense. They don't have a single exegetical key the way Christians do with Christ in reading Scripture. And this we will see uh, when we look at the Bible, uh, at the, the Christian readings of the next couple of weeks. When Christians read Scripture, they find Christ. When Jews read the Bible, they find all kinds of things. All kinds of things. Okay, everybody, time is up. Hope section.